Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Good afternoon and welcome to Do the Math. I'm Michael. I'm Lennon. For math homework, help call in Bakersfield 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Email math at kern.org. We're online at dothemathonline.net. On and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So, Lennon, what grade are you in? Fourth grade. How is fourth grade? Good. Yeah, where do you go to school? St. Francis Parish School. Yeah, and how's that? Good. Everything's good? Yeah. Nothing's great. Everything's good? No, it's great. It's great? Yeah. Okay, so what is so great about fourth grade so far this year? I have a lot of friends, and everyone is really nice. Well, that's good. It's good to have a lot of friends, right? Especially now that you're back at school and you can hang out with your friends and stuff like that. What kinds of things have you been doing in math this year? We've been learning about fractions and two-digit multiplications. And has any of that been difficult for you, or you kind of just get it as you're going along and everything seems no, to be... No, it's been difficult. It's been difficult? Yes. All right, well, we're going to work on that a little bit today then. Okay. All right. So you know how to multiply, but it's the two-digit by two-digit thing that's yeah. giving you a little bit of problem right now? Uh-huh. All right, well, we're going to work on that a little bit. But first, you need to help me out. Okay. You ready for that? Sure. Okay, that's what I want to hear. Sure. Doesn't matter what it is, you're ready to help out the old man. All right. <laughs> you know, you read all that social media stuff, right? Read it again for me. For math homework, help... Oh, no, it's just the bottom part you can go to. Oh, and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Do you have any of that stuff? I like, do you have any of it, or do you just know about it? I have YouTube. You have YouTube. Yes. All right, so you go to YouTube and check out different things and stuff like that? Yes. All right, well, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, right? I mean, it's pretty interesting. You can find a lot, basically anything you need, I think you could be able to find on YouTube, right? Yeah. You're going to be famous on YouTube after tonight. Did you know that? Yeah, no. Indeed you are. Once about 6 o'clock rolls around, I think you are. But anyway, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because you and I right now are going to take a look at today's problem of the day that was presented on different social media, and it says, find the volume of the cube. So... Do you know what volume means? No. Okay. Do you know what a cube is? Yes. All right. What do you know about a cube? What can you tell me about a cube? Well, it's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Well, take a look at it. That's a picture of a cube, right? What do you notice about it? It's squared. Okay. It's square, right? What yes. do you What do you else do you notice about the square? Are they the it's same all around? No, because it has the face of a... Okay, so the face, face, so you know some different terminology with yeah. a cube, right? They have faces, right? They have edges, they have vertices and stuff like that. But if the front is a square, what is the back? Is that square also? Yeah. Okay, and what about the top and bottom? They're squares. They're squares also, right? So a cube has all of the sides the same. Right. There you go, right? So that's those are things that you can talk about as far as a cube goes. Now, how big is each side. What's the measurement of? Four inches. Okay, so it's four. Now, if you want to find the perimeter, do you know what perimeter is? Yes. What is that? It's when all the sides, so like you could say you have a square that's a four by four on each side and then a six by six on the other side. It would be 
It would be 20. Right. It would be 20, right? Because you get to add the sixes and you get to add the fours, right? So the right. perimeter is all the way around it. Yeah. The area is It's when you multiply. Well, see, you already know that already, right? So what would the area be if it was a six by four? It would be 24. 24, right? 24 square, whatever it is. Square feet, square inches, square miles, whatever it is, right? So volume is going to the next level because okay. volume is going to be how much stuff we can put inside that whole cube. Okay. So what do you think we're going to do with that 4? Because we're going to have to multiply it, right? Yeah. But once we multiply 4 times 4, do you think we're done? No. What else do you think we need to do? Okay, we're gonna, you know, it's going to go in the box and along with a lot of other stuff, right? So we're going to go 4 by 4 is 16. Right. But when you're doing volume, you need three measurements, height, length, and width. Okay. Okay? So if all of them are 4, we're going to go 4 times 4 times 4. So what's 4 times 4? Four? Uh, <laughs> sorry. 4 times 4 is... I'm blanking on it. Six. That's okay. So, yeah, you just said 16, right? Okay. So 4 times 4 is 16. Now look at some of the options up there. We have 64 and we have 16, and we have both of them written down twice. But we know we have to times it by another 4. So do you think 16 can even be an answer? No. No. All right. So here's a clue for you. What's 16 times 4? 64. There you go. So 64. Now, you think it's going to be 64 square inches or cubic inches? Cubic inches? Why? Because it sounds like you're guessing. Actually, no, it's square inches. It's square inches. Well, which one is it now? It's square inches. Are you sure? No. Okay, well, that's good. I'm glad you said no. So, you thought it was cubic inches, but then you said it might be square inches. Yes. Now, think about how many numbers did we multiply? Four. Well, we multiplied the number four how oh. many times? Four, four times four, four times, times four. four. So there three. Were three times, right? Yeah. Okay, so that because we had three dimensions. Okay, if we were just doing the area of the page, it's length times width. Okay. And that's square inches. Okay. But if we want everything inside the book, we're now going to have to add the height measurement to that also. Okay. So instead of square inches, which one do you think it would be? Cubic, cubic inches. inches. So we're going to go with 64 cubic inches? Yeah. All right, let's take a look and see if the answer is correct. 64 cubic inches is correct. First one done. You ready to keep going? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure you are. That was only that problem of the day, right? That was for all of the adults and all the other kids that are on social media, and they have time and they go ahead and they look at that stuff. You ready okay. for more? Yeah. All right. Well, before we get to any of your problems, we're first going to take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, so today's Math in the News has to do with spring training. Do you know what spring training is? No. It has to deal with baseball. Do you know anything about baseball? Yes. What do you know about baseball? Well, there's bases and there's different types of players. There's the pitchers, there's the batters. Okay. So spring training is when they get ready for the regular season. Okay. So all this month, there are all the different teams are in Arizona and Florida for spring training. And there are new rules this year. Have you heard about these? No. Now, you're a Dodger fan, right? Right. Okay, so you're going to have to get together with this and make sure you know what's going on because if you watch the Dodgers on TV or you happen to go see them sometime, you need to know what's going on. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a photo of, what position is that? Pitcher. Right. And what else do you notice in that photo of that? There's that timer going down. Right, there's the timer, right? Do you have any idea why there's a timer there now? Is it getting close to the end of the game? Or well, no. that's what we're going to find out, right? Okay. Okay. Have you ever been to a, a live baseball game? I have no idea. You don't remember going to a baseball game? Oh, I have, I think, actually. Okay. Well, you know what? You've got yourself two tickets from CSUB Athletics, so you might be able to go to a CSUB baseball game. Sound good? All right. All right. Not the same level as the Dodgers, but 
you never know, some of those guys might be Dodgers. So anyway, let's take a look. So what they want to do with baseball is they want to speed the game up a little bit faster because a lot of times people go, I like baseball, but I don't want to go for over three hours to watch a baseball game. So they're trying to speed it up. And a lot of times when the guy gets the ball and he's ready to pitch the ball, he could take a lot of time. Right. And that will slow everything down. So now that's why they put a timer there to make them throw it faster than what they want to sometimes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we can see here, once he gets the ball, he has 15 seconds to throw the ball before he could take as long as he wanted. Right. He could take a minute if he wanted to, right? So the hitter gets one timeout per plate appearance, but the batter has to be ready within eight seconds. So even though the pitcher is kind of in a hurry, the batter is also, all right? They get two disengagements, which means they can kind of step off the rubber, but this is more than what you need to know right now. So these are just the rules for people that watch baseball a lot. And what they're saying is they have already started this in the minor leagues. Okay. So when the guys are learning how to play baseball a little better before they become a Dodger, they are on teams getting them ready to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So they do this already in the minor leagues so that they get used to it, but now it's going to happen in the major leagues. So with the bases empty, they have 15 seconds to get rid of the ball instead okay. of all day, whatever they want to take. All right. So it says the first 19 spring training games, which have already happened this week. Okay averaged two and a half hours before it used to take three hours. So three hours was a long time. Now they're saying it takes about two and a half hours, so they're speeding it up by 25 minutes. So that seems pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, you're able to speed it up. If you were able to get out of school 25 minutes faster, would you like that? No. You like to be at school? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's the proper answer right there because you want to get as much education as you can, right? And you like school. You're hanging out with your friends, you're learning and doing things like that. But if you don't follow the rules, things happen, correct? Right. There's always consequences. So one person was not ready by the eight second mark and therefore they got an automatic strike. So do you know in baseball if you get three strikes, you're out? Yeah. You've heard that. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you're playing this year and you used to taking your time. And you get up there, and you're not quite ready, and the clock says seven. And now you look ready, they're going to call a strike on you already before the guy has even thrown a, a pitch to you. So you have to be ready. Okay. All right? So when you watch some baseball games this year, what I want you to do is I want you to check that out. You going to okay. do that? Yeah. All right. That is today's Math in the News. And we can see the timer right there, right? He's down to four seconds, right? So it's a good thing he's winding up, getting ready to get rid of that ball, right? He looks pretty ready. He looks pretty ready. What's the one thing we don't like about this photo, though, you and I? They're pirates. They're fans. pirates, right? We don't like Pittsburgh Pirates. And we're cool if people do like them, but they're not our teams, right? Right. Okay. So we do have phone tutors available until 5.30, most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Lennon is a fourth grade student at St. Francis, and you've been working on a lot of math so far, right? Right. Okay, well, we're going to get to some of that. But you know what? Let's do one problem right now. Okay. You ready? Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at which one do you want to do first? Seven. Seven? All right. So one-fourth of 64 balloons were red. All right, so why don't you go over to the board. Do you know how to write one-fourth? And then next to it, write of, the word of, 64. So the problem says one-fourth of 64 balloons were red. Okay. Now, we know we have to do something with those two numbers. I think I know. What do you think it is? Is it 64 divided by 4? No, why do you think that? That's what my teacher told me once. Okay. What, do you know what the word of means in mathematics? No. Okay, so there's four things you can always do with numbers. Do you know what they are? You can divide numbers, right? Divide, subtract, addition, and multiply. Good, so those are the four things you can do with the, the numbers, right? Right. So of is going to be multiply. Okay. So what I want you to do is above the word of, put a multiplication symbol. So it means one-fourth times 64. 
Now, if you wanted to turn 64 into a fraction, what would you need to do? Yeah. Is there anything you can do? If I put the number 1 under 64, so that I draw... That would be a... Um, we learned about this yesterday. It would be an improper fraction. It would be, right? But if we go 64 divided by 1, what would that answer be? 64. 64, so it doesn't change it at all, right? Mm -hmm. So you said you want to go 64 divided by 4. Yes. Do that on the side and explain to me what you're doing. So 4 can't go, well, 4 goes into 6 one time because okay. it can't, because that would be 8. So it goes in one time and it stays as it's 4 and then you bring down the 4. 4 goes into 24. Is Six times, so then you write the six up there. I don't really have. Do you want me to move the screen down for yeah. you a little bit? All right, hold on one second. So How's you that? have the twenty-four there, and then you have zero for a remainder. All right, good. So zero remainder. So that means it worked out perfectly. Yeah. So sixty-four divided by four is what? Sixteen. So let's take a look at the problem again. It says one fourth of the sixty-four balloons were red. How many balloons were red? 16. There you go. So write it down on your paper so that you've got it. And if you need to, you can write down the 64 divided by 4 so that you can show your work. But 16 of the balloons were red. So I'm going to let you write that. Just a reminder, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. Have you ever seen insects battle? No. All right. Well, let's check this out. see their antennae go up and down and then one of them will sometimes lunge at the other one jump at the other one stand aside these so-called leaf-footed insects are getting ready to rumble and for entomologist Christine Miller that means it's time to get to work it's more like someone doing mixed martial arts and that they fight in a so many different ways and so we can study the the shape of their weapons and the function of their weapons and how they're related to the ways in which the bugs fight. With support from the National Science Foundation, Miller and her team at the University of Florida study animal weapons as a key to understanding their behavior, diversity, and evolution. And it's a great group of insects. Some of them are huge, some of them are, are tiny. Uh, they just seem to have such a diversity of shapes, body shapes, that we can use them to uh, do all sorts of different experiments and also behavioral observations uh, that they're just a really powerful way to better understand science. They collect a lot of specimens at this campus organic garden. This is a juvenile and it hasn't developed big fighting legs yet. When we think as humans about weaponry, we often think about lethal weaponry, weapons designed to kill. Animal weapons are used to get that opponent away, to succeed in getting a territory, maybe to get access to females for potential matings. Uh, they rarely, rarely fight to the death. And like human wrestlers, insects, usually males, have some signature moves. The short squeeze, the leg wrap, the pounce and rap, and it's all to get the girl. Yeah, I've never seen two males fighting this hard for one female. But it's not always the big bug on campus that's a hit with the ladies. Miller says some females also factor in complex odors when choosing a mate. Experiments like this show a boy bug has to do more than fight to impress a female. A tasty dinner goes a long way too. The males release olfactory cues to um, reel in the, the ladies, and um, the cactus that they live on also emits odors. So the female has a choice between a high-quality male on a low-quality cactus pad or a low-quality male on a high-quality cactus pad. See, it's, it's a one-legged male, and it was actually aiming that missing leg towards the other one. Of course, when you fight, sooner or later, you're going to lose. Miller says that's why these insects have evolved something called autotomy. If they get in a tricky situation and something grabs a leg like a, a bird, or they just get trapped, they could actually do a little like twist, shake sort of thing, and they actually sever their leg off at a breakage plane. 
Miller says studying insect behaviors will help us understand everything from pest management to how habitat and climate change impacts a range of animal populations. A lot of people don't think about insect conservation, but if we lose species of insects, uh, we could have ecosystems fall apart to some extent and be adversely affected. A little knowledge is a powerful weapon. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. Always cool to see insects in battle and things like that. And they were talking, like, this is where they get ideas for horror movies and stuff right. like that. So <laughs> that's all good stuff, right? Do you hey. like horror movies, scary movies, stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, all right. That's nope. cool. You know, I like those too. You know nope. what? Nope. 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 You'll have none of that. Nope. I'm good. All right. Anyway, <laughs> we've got Mickey in studio with us also. And uh, track season is coming up, huh? Yeah, we, we were able to. Uh, Get a bunch of our events done with a little bit of downpour. Uh, not oh, so it was much. raining at your school? It, it was sprinkling, and uh, that's California rain. Yeah, when it, it was, sprinkles, yeah. right? So it was enough where uh, it was interesting, but you know, we got luckily no, no one was doing serious long distance. So, what are some of the events that an elementary school, junior high school kid would compete in? Uh, I mean, anything from the hundred meter sprint or dash, uh, where it's a little longer than a football field, to the three thousand meter which is approximately two to three miles. I don't think I, I mean, I was I well, there's, there's different ones, like in, there's different ones in between. I would run three miles. You would like to run the three mile one? Yeah. It's not terrible. All right, well, I think mom over I mean, there is <laughs> taking a little <laughs> chuckle of that one. <laughs> I you can know run what? three miles, she's just never seen me run. Well, maybe your mom would go out running with you. Oh, this, this is the same there thing. Mom, if, mom, if a tree falls in the forest and no one sees it, it doesn't really make running. a sound. That's what we're talking about. That's if I the run last three miles thing mom no would do with it. me is go run three miles. Yeah. Well, that would be the last thing I'd do with you, too, probably, is go run three miles. So anyway, I'd rather do the 100-yard dash, 100 I'll, meter. Right? I'll time everyone when I was in school, it was yards, miles. not meters. But anyway, <laughs> let it, let's head back to the board. You and Mickey are going to continue with the problem that we were just doing. So remember we had one-fourth of 64 and you determined that was 16. Yeah. So now what we need to do is we need to figure out what percent were not red because 16 were red. Okay. So talk me through why are we subtracting first? Because you need to find out what percent of it is not red. Is 16 a percent or just the number of balloons? It's the number. Okay, you right. So I just want you to make sure we're, we're red. right. Finding the number that aren't so red and we'll use that. You can't do that, so you have to turn that to a 14. Five. So we've got the 48. What does the 48 mean though? 48 what? Percent. Not percent. Because one fourth was our percentage. One fourth can be transformed to a percent. You said one fourth of the 64 total balloons are red. 16 yeah. of them, right? Yeah. So then you subtracted. We had a total. 40 are not red. There we go, right? So it's not necessarily a percentage, but it's the number that are not red. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, from here, how do you think we could find 48 out of 64 as a percentage? There's a couple different ways. Do you have any strategies in mind? Do you find half? No. Have you just simplified fractions before? I think... Like if I say, oh, 48 can be divided by this and so can 64? Yes. Okay. What can they both be divided by? They can both be divided by 8. 8. Nice big number. That'll work. Go ahead and tell me, write down, what was our new equivalent fraction? So 48 divided by 8 in the numerator, 64 divided by 8 in the denominator. Go ahead and write them in. Good. And our top one? Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah, 6 over 8. Now we can continue to get a little smaller because to make a percentage, what's the highest percent you can get on a test? 100%. A hundred. Unless you do it for extra credit. Unless you do it for extra credit. But typically... It's 100 out of 100. Right? It's 100 out of 100. So what makes this a percentage is having the 100 in the denominator. Okay. By having a hundred down here, that means the number on top is a percentage. Okay. He said something about 64, like he said something about, which is an improper fraction. Right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take six over eight and we're gonna reduce it again. What else can this be divided by? Okay. 
they got to be the eight. same number. How is eight and eight before? Uh, same number in numerator and well, denominator. She may be writing down what it comes out to be already. Or are you? I'm confused. What do you want to put down there? It would be four. You divide it by two in your head. Okay. So now we have three over four. Let me ask you this. Is there a way to make four become 100? Like four times something? Four times six. Wait, no? That'll be 24. Let's go a lot bigger. No, I was going to say 64, but that's not it. Right. I don't think. Is 100 four. like a dollar? Like 100 pennies makes a dollar? Like 100 right. cents? Is there four of a coin that would make a dollar? <gasps> Quarter. Yeah, how much is a quarter worth? 25 cents. So what are we going to multiply by? 25. Multiply by 25, numerator so and denominator. 25. We're just going to say times 25. And then tell me what our new fraction would be. 3 times 25. 3 quarters. 75 cents. 75 cents, good. Over, because we have a fraction still. Wait. Yeah, fraction box. Oh, OK. Four so times then 25. 4 times 25 is 100. Mm -hmm. Now, do we have a number over 100? 100. Do we have a number over 100? 75. Yeah. So because it's over 100, 75 is a percent also. So you took a fraction, 48 out of 64, meaning 48 of the balloons that are not red, is the same as saying... 75. 75 out of 100. 100. But if something's out of 100, I could also say 75 percent. Percent. So that's my answer. What do you think? Does that sound about right? Yeah. You're right. Again, so we can take any fraction and we can break it down to a point where I can turn it, the denominator, into 100. If I can turn my denominator into 100, it makes it a percentage. And then whatever my numerator is, is my percentage. Mick, what I want you to do with her now is talk about how we can just reason our way through this. If we know that one-fourth is red, what percent is not red? Without doing any math, reason through it where we know one-fourth is the same as what percent and then do it that way. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So one-fourth, what would you say this is as a percentage? If you have one-fourth of something. 25%. 25%. Well, if 25% are red, what percent are not red? 75%. There you go. That's it. So what we did, and I always like to do the students on here, we, we show the mathematical reasoning why. What you've done is you said, oh, I know this. We call it a benchmark, a number that's really easy to work with. You know, one-fourth, that's the same as 25%. So then the other piece is, if this is one-fourth, what's the other part of it? All right, so if I have four-fourths is my total, and this is one-fourth, how much is this one? Three-fourths. Three-fourths. So one-fourth is the same as 25%, and three-fourths is the same as 75%. And okay. you did that without doing any math. But I always like to show you the actual reasoning why, but once you get really good with fractions and their corresponding percentages, it's easier to work through them. You don't have to do all the math because you know why. There you go. And you did do math. You just did mental math. That's right. Right. So you were able to think about that in your head, right? Right. So it makes sense thinking about, well, one-fourth is this, so three-fourths is not. And hopefully that makes sense to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Lennon, a fourth grade student from St. Francis Parish School, Ooh. is going to be continuing to work with us. But first, we're going to check out Science for Kern and Paper Airplanes. Good afternoon. It's great to be back with our another engineering challenge this afternoon. Uh, today we're going to be investigating um, paper airplanes. You ready, students? Yes. yes. All right, so to begin, we're going to be making a very simple, basic design for paper airplanes. And raise your hand if you know like some crazy sophisticated way to build a paper airplane. All right, awesome, I'm sure you all do. But for this activity, I want you to build my design. Our uh, variable that we're going to alter today has to do with weight. 
for a paper airplane, but we're all gonna fold the same. So are you ready? Yeah. So we're going to hot dog fold. Hot dog fold like me. And crease. So we have this, hot dog fold. Then we're going to open it up. Now take the these two corners, see where my fingers are? And we're going to fold those in, like so. Fold them in toward the center so that it makes this shape and crease them. And we're gonna leave those closed. Just like that. Amazing. You're all terrific folders. Now, take one side and curl it in like so to the center. Just like that. And crease it. Crease it like mine. And then I'm going to roll the other side in to the center, right on that center crease, and fold. All right, so we need to do one more fold on each side now, except this time. So right now, check this out. I'm, I got the flappies towards you. I'm gonna turn it over. And I'm gonna take one side and fold back this way. And this part, there's some variety in terms of how far you fold, but I'm gonna fold back about that much because that's going to become like my wing, like that. Can you see that? And the other side is going to fold like that. So I've got that part folded over like that way, and then the other part folded over. Just like that, okay? So the next thing that you need to do, you get to decide on is this. Everyone has a paper clip. And the paper clip, you get to add to your paper airplane as a weight. Now, the, the um, the part where you have choice is you can decide where do you want to attach this paper clip. Do you want to put it on the nose, on the underside, on the back, on one of the wings? Where do you think the weight of the paper clip might make your paper airplane fly further? And once you've made that decision, what I'd like for you to do uh, in the time that we have left is I would like for you to find a place in this area in the middle of the room and we're gonna watch out for each other, but we're going to do some testing all at one time. So stay on this side of the room and find a place do your best to avoid hitting your friends, but test your airplane a couple of times and see where that uh, paper clip might be the best place to put it to make your paper airplane fly the farthest. So what are you trying? Let's see what you're trying. I'm trying at the beginning, and that actually helps. Okay, so where are you going to move it now? I'm gonna keep it where I had it, because if I put it on the end, then it entirely flips the paper airplane, which I know okay. is good. Like, on, on the nose there? Yeah. Okay. okay, let's see what happens there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what happens when you launch it that way, and then you can tell us whether it goes further or not. Okay, so which way was better? Uh, on the nose. On the nose, excellent. So what have you tried? What? What have you tried? Um, I have tried throwing it up and down. 
Okay, and have you moved the uh, paper clip? Yes. And so what are you finding to be the most effective? The most effective is probably... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. The most effective is probably throwing it up. Okay, and so which do you think that, where have you had the paper clip on your airplane? Right here and right here. Okay, and where did it go farther, when it was here or here? Mostly here. And why do you think that's so? Because, uh, maybe because of like, how I threw it, it just, just brought it down a little more. So do you think there might be something to having weight up front versus weight on the back? Yeah. All right. We are going to continue testing our airplanes uh, here at school, and I'm going to go ahead and send it back to you. All right, thanks for that, Michelle, and thank you also to everybody at Science for Kern helping out do the math this year and for many years and many more years to come. You like doing paper airplanes? Have you ever made a paper airplane? No? Yeah. What? Well, maybe when you get done with your math homework here, oh. we'll make a paper airplane. Now, tonight, you can send it to your teacher tomorrow and set it up like that. All right, but we won't do that right now. You ready to do some more math? Yeah. Let's take a look at one of the other problems that was presented on social media. And this said, did you know you can cut a cake into eight pieces with only three cuts? No, I did not know that. You did not know that? No. You will know it today. Now, th just think about this. All right, you have a cake. All right, and you want to use only three cuts. Is it one, two, three? Okay, so here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do is go over to the board because you made a beautiful birthday cake right there for us. <laughs> all right, so get over there. We have little firecrackers on top. Or there are those candles. candles. Oh, okay. candles. Right. candles. I was say, firecrackers. Fire. That'd be more eventful, right? Firecrackers. <laughs> all right, so. Maybe uh, make sure that she has a different color marker, Mick, than red. I do. All right. So draw with a, like a dotted line where you think the cuts would be. So you're just going to cut the cake in half down the middle, right? Right. And that would be two, two pieces. And then you cut it across, and that would oh. be four pieces. And now how many pieces would it be in? Six pieces, and you've already used your three cuts, correct? Right. So doing it that way won't work. So let's get rid of your last cut. Whoop. Let's bring back that second cut. All right. So there's two cuts, and you've got four. Do you want to still stay like that, or do you want to start brand new again? I want to take back this cut that laid back. You want to take back that? All right. So are you still happy with that one, or do you want to get rid of it? I want to keep that. You're going to keep that? All right, so there's one cut, but you had the cake in two pieces now. All right, okay. so what do you think you want to do next? Let's see. Okay, so you're going to do a diagonal cut and another diagonal cut. So you've got three cuts now. How many pieces? You got six again? Yeah. Hey, you still got six. So All let's right. think of it maybe from like the top down right now. So we have the top of the cake we're looking at. Right. How would you cut it right here? Because I know sometimes trying to make three-dimensional cuts is not always the easiest. Okay. Now, how many pieces did that give us? Two. Okay. And then we could say maybe here's the side view. Would it be? Top and our side. Wait, now this is. Okay, so That's you're in the four. four. And I need eight. Would it be? Nope, that's the one you keep doing. Ah! <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll bring okay. it back. All right. So we're in four. Now we have to double it to eight somehow. Mm, that's hard. I actually don't know. I don't think. Because hmm. right now, I ha if I were to like cut these slices apart, I would have this slice. I have four of these, right? Right. I have four of these massive wedges of cake. This cake is good. But how do I double them? How would I create twice as much, uh, how many, create twice as many By slices? Cutting it differently. Cutting it differently. Differently, but let's go a little, like how differently? What would we do? Mm. 
We don't know, that's okay, that's why we're here. So, right now we have four pieces, right? From right. the top, I have four big slices of cake. Because remember, cake is good. Okay. But, we have to I think to I'm gonna take back them. this one. Keep that one. Oh, Let's okay. Keep both of those. Okay. okay. So right now, we have four pieces. We need to double it. What if we cut it in half? Not on there, use the side. Aha, because now, Remember, we still have four pieces on the top, but now that's if I just cut it in half, that's how so show that on the other one, the birthday set. cake she drew. Make the first cut where you're dividing the whole cake in half across. Like six, though. Mm -hmm. Here's why. So even though it looks like six, here's what it looks like three dimensions. Because it looks one, right. two, three, four. Six. Right. We got to remember it's a side view. So if we were to cut it, right, we're going to go across. Oh. I think we just got it. I think we are there. So here we go. We have one slice. Now the cake's in half, right? Right. Another one this way. Now the cake is in four pieces. And if we slice it through the middle, we have four on top and now four, four on, on the, the bottom. bottom. Yes. How many slices now in total? Eight. Yeah. And Eight that's pieces, using it with three, three cuts, right? So first of all, what you can do is go right to the middle of the cake, slice it right across so it looks like you have a bottom cake and top cake, and then do you two cuts, and now you have eight pieces with only three cuts. I don't know, I kind of like our idea, three cuts, six pieces, we all get a bunch of slices, right? Right. All right, I was on the, We yeah. would each get two slices. Two slices each, there we go, none for Mike. We'll split Whoa, the other Oh, you get, get two, three. you get two, I get four. No, 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 no You no, said no, you no, get two slices each, so that's the way it's gonna work right there. <laughs> No, but there's Ooh, with the buzzer. Seconds. Yeah, you don't want them yeah, getting any seconds. at all. That's, That's right. I'll share it with the guys in the back. The <laughs> all right, let's take a look at another one of your problems. Oh, got the dinger on that. Sharing cake with the guys in the back. All right. Here we go. So here's another one of the problems from your homework. Okay. So let's take a look at this. We have a cube, and this is how we started the program. Remember this, Lennon? Right. All right, we had a cube. But this one, we're going to have to do something a little different. It says, name a pair of parallel edges. Mm. So first of all, think about what parallel is. Talk to Mickey about that. And parallel. then from yeah. there, they're name a pair of cross. parallel they're always, edges. They're always going to stay either or they're never going to cross. Right? You tell me. They're never going to cross. Yeah, you're right. So parallel straight. can be any two lines that are never going to intersect on the same plane. So whether they're diagonal, vertical, horizontal, doesn't matter. So we know parallel means, but now the idea is looking at that cube, there we go, looking at that cube on the screen there, what edges do you think are parallel? Meaning if we were to continue those edges forever in either direction, they would never touch. A to E. A, E. e. Do you know how to write down edge names, like side lengths, when I say like from I this point to that point? Show me what you think. What do you think? So you think? A. E, I think there's a line on the bottom or the top. Line on the top. Yeah. Perfect. So that means the line from A to E. Perfect. And then. What else? E to, I can't see it. I can't see it either. There it is. E to F. E to F. So let's see. I'm looking at line AE. If I'm looking at the top of the cube, line AE goes this way and EF goes that way. Are these oh. eventually going to meet? Yeah. Yeah, we don't want those. So let's come up with a different second line, different second edge there. Hmm. Would it be G, C to G? Or what do you think? I mean, AE's on top, G. CG's on the bottom. If I continue those forever, will they touch? Yeah. Okay, let's write it in. Go for it. All right, Mike, how'd we do? You did wonderfully. Now I want you to find another pair. Ooh, this is like bonus. Oh, so uh -oh. is you that found extra credit? We're talking about over 100% Find a now. bonus pair. I don't pair think now. my teacher is going to give me extra credit for this, but we'll You're see. just going to get extra credit with do the math, so here we go. Okay. All right. What do you think? Second pair. What would you want me to write down for the next pair of parallel edges or sides? E to F. E, F, okay. E, F. Sticking with that E, F. Won't let it go. All right. D to H. D to H. Are you sure? No. What? 
I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I just want you to it's explain like it to me. A to E is like the C to G. It's gonna be like this and never like touch Like top on the over sides. the bottom. And it's same with F, uh, H to D and E to F. It's on the sides and. Well, I'm saying E touch. to F goes more horizontal on the back one, right? And then D to oh, H. Oh yeah. Wait. You're, I mean, they may never touch. They're on like different planes here, but I wouldn't say they're parallel. Is it? Is it E to A and F to E? Nope, E to A is still oh. going to be coming to that point. Horizontal so you're saying points. E to F on the top far side, right? Right. So we have it here. I need another one that also goes horizontal. So we're talking E to F, A to B, G to H, C to D. Which one of those do you think would be parallel? Well, I have A, E, and B to G. Do we not have a cube somewhere? You got a cube over there, Mike? Anyone? Yeah, it's on the screen right there. <laughs> You know, three-dimensional cubes, you know, that's the uh, the other right, part right. of the uh, Common Core Standards here is that so realia. So, <laughs> is it, would B to A and F to E still be going horizontal? Please? Right, so yeah. F to E and B to A, yeah, that would work. Yep, because they're both okay. on top going left to right. Go and write so. those in. I'll erase mine. Oh, no, are we keeping that one? Yeah, we're keeping E to F. Okay, E to F, F and what other one? Can't have F again. You can have A though. To B? Write it right. down. We'll double check. A to B. And our line. All right, go to Mike. That is correct. Yes. All right, so now we have that all set. All right. Now we need perpendicular edges. Whoa. Perpendicular. What does that mean? They cross. They cross. Wait. Wait. I'll wait. It's like on the top of my tongue. Perpendicular. So if parallel meant they never touched. These can touch. They can touch, but in a specific way. So when they do touch, what do they have to make? They have to make. What kind of angle? They have to make a mm. right angle. Right angle, very good. So as long as they touch and make a right angle, we would call those perpendicular lines, just like you're making there. And the way we recognize those is with our 90 degree angle symbol in there. So where on that cube do we see where two lines are meeting to create a perpendicular or right angle? Mm. What do you think? How about I start you out with AB? See AB going across the front there? Yeah. What else does AB intersect with or make a vertice with that makes a right angle. C to D. Oh, wait, no. Let's take a look. C to D. Hmm, well, C to D is down below. Is it ever going to intersect? No. Those are going to be parallel. So if I have A to B there, where Can else? It be B to D. B to D. Do they eventually meet and yeah, make a right angle? A to B, wait. A to B is like. Wait, no. I messed up. I need to draw the. Ah. Trying to draw the. The cube? Yeah. Yes. Nice. Good. Pretty nice. Much right, okay. A, am I doing You're right, right, yeah. A to A B. A to B. Good. D, oh, that's a B. D to, to A. Not H. I know, but I'm writing Oh, okay, I'm gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Square. Doing the whole square, okay. E to, how am I, where am I meant to write F? Do I have like an, oh wait. It's that back corner, yep. And then G to C. All right, very good. So now what points are gonna make perpendicular line or perpendicular Edges. intersection? Perpendicular vertice, now we're talking. Um, well, D to B, they would finally intersect so because A and B. Kind of, here, wait, can I get a different color? Go for it. They would go here and then they would finally connect. Okay, so we have A and B, and what other one? A and B and okay. B to D. B to D, very good. Yep. So when we do perpendicular lines, typically we're going to have something in common because they have to meet at that point. 
they have to both have one of the same letters. Exactly. They have the to meet. The one that at the end and the ones at the beginning. Very good. Nice All right. So we'll take a look at a little yes. bit about that in just a moment. But first, we have this opportunity to check out what's new at SeaTech. In my section, which is the grooming section in animal care, we work with animals. Uh, we teach them how to handle them appropriately and ultimately how to groom them properly. Our focus this year is actually brushing and bathing dogs correctly. I think the most challenging part of it is learning all of the different things you have to do with the animals, the different terminologies for their body parts, um, behavioral problems with the dogs, like how you have to know if the dog's going to bite or if the dog's nervous. I think it's really just anticipating the behavior and learning how to work around it. For me, I think it's just really getting used to the students and being able to communicate to them exactly what it is we're looking for because everybody has a different way of learning. Most math that we use in the program is just time management, um, basic addition and subtraction, a lot of multiplication too, and division. We're minimal in grooming. Ultimately, we have to mix our shampoos, we have to mix our cleaning solutions. And when we're dealing with clientele, we're also collecting money, calculating the fees if there are any. So they have a little bit of math going on here. I think the most fun part is being able to work with different people and different animals and to gain a lot of different hands-on experience for um, the career that you may or may not want to do. I think a really good upside to it too, it helps you figure out if you really want to continue in vet med or not. The kids and the animals. I mean, it's just really great to see how they interact with the animals and enjoy them and how they learn to do this. And they have total joy doing it, which is nice. These kids are here because they want to be, not because they have to be. Community classroom is basically during our second semester we get sent out to different vet clinics, grooming facilities, and or boarding facilities and we learn from the people there and we learn to build relationships in a professional manner and we learn what it's like to work in an office with actual clients. The internships with community classroom, um, one of them is obviously here. Um, the students that are here with me for the second semester of community classroom, in, in essence that is their internship. And my goal is for them to be able to do a brush and bath dog from start to finish, from the minute they take uh, hold of it to the minute they finish it, which includes trimming their feet and whatever's appropriate to the breed standard. If they can do that completely, they're ready to go into a shop as a brusher bather and start working. And thanks to Wendy and all the staff and students over at ROC and SeaTech. And all of those videos that we've been viewing this year are 100% produced by the students at ROC and SeaTech. Lennon, a fourth grade student from St. Francis Parish School, is in studio with us today. Everything been going well so far? Yes. It's not that difficult doing this, is it? No. Nope. All right, back to the board then, young lady. Let's check this one out. Do you have a favorite player on your team, the Dodgers? Bellinger. Cody? He's not a Dodger anymore. Do you know that? What? He went to Chicago. Which Chicago? Cubs. Oh! Man. All right, anyway, he can still be your favorite player. Do you know what number he was? I think he, my brother was wearing the shirt this morning. Uh, no, I forget, actually. What number would you like to make it? 13. 13. 13. All right, so we're going to go 13. 
And we're going to go with one of my favorite guys of all time. Ron Guidry was number 49. My other play would be too easy to multiply the number, so we're going to go with a different one. So, Lennon, go ahead and multiply 13 times 49. And explain to Mickey what you're doing. So first I'm going to multiply these. 3 times 9 is 27. And then that's 9. That's 11. So, wait, did I write the 1 there? Is, is there any word to carry it? No. So we just write it down. Yep. And you write the 0 under the 7. Okay. Now you do, you cross that out because you don't need that anymore. Okay. Now you're doing these three. Okay. So four times three is 12. Mm. Wait, I wrote it the wrong way. There we go. Oh, hold on, pause there, partner. So when you did 9 times 3 before, it was 27. You dropped the 7 and regrouped the 2. 4 oh, times 3. Yep. Yeah, mm, all right, you got it. There you go. No, you're good. Oh. This 2 doesn't exist anymore. Oh, okay. You already used it. So we keep the 2. But before, when you had 27, you brought down the 7 and regrouped the 2. Right. So for 12, I keep the 2, but regroup the... 2, 1. The 1. 1 goes up top now. Now we keep going. So 1 times 4 is 4. So, oh well, wait, 5. Ah, there we go, good. Now what do we do? Add. Okay. 7, 3, 6. So it's 637. Nice. All right, we're going to do one more real quickly. You're going to go ahead and come over here and you're going to do my problem. We're going to change it to 14 times 49. Go for it. Four times nine is, wait, didn't it? Oh, no. So four times nine is, I have to ask. You got it. Thirty. And this is good uh, because Len essentially was having a oh. problem with her oh, nines, okay. so it's good we're doing the nines. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. You caught it. I caught it. Now 1 times 9 is 9, then it's 12, so there's nowhere else to carry. Very good. Now, one thing I want you to do is when you cross out, so go ahead and put your 0, cross out your 9, and cross out anything else you already regrouped. That's the one thing a lot of students will forget about is they'll keep the regrouped numbers, but they won't get rid of them. All right, wrap it up our last step, 4 times 4. 16. Oh, that regroup. Don't forget about our regrouping. Oh. Always regroup, no matter what <laughs> stage you're at. You could be nine rows in. We always regroup. You got to regroup. One from the 16. Oh, yeah, five. There we go. And let's add up our pieces. 686. 86. Nice. There you go. Uh, well done. So, yeah. Lennon, I've got two questions for you. First, did you learn a little something today? Yep. Good. Did you have fun today? Yes. That's the most important thing right there. Do remember we have phone tutors available until 5.30 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.